And now, broadcasting on Star Worldwide Networks, it's time for the Cannabis Reporter Radio Show with Snowden Bishop. Listen in as Snowden interviews cannabis industry pioneers, marijuana experts, policymakers, medical practitioners, patients, and other amazing individuals with compelling stories to share. It all happens right now. Here's the cannabis reporter, Snowden Bishop. Hi, and welcome back to the Cannabis Reporter Radio Show. I'm your host, Snowden Bishop, and so happy you could join us today. The relationship between doctors and patients has always been built on trust, mainly with the patient relying upon the doctor to come up with a diagnosis and treatment, and the patient trusting that they'll get well in the doctor's care. Now that 28 states regulate cannabis for medical use, patients are looking to find ways in which cannabis can improve their treatment outcomes. With the groundbreaking revelations about the endocannabinoid system and countless clinical studies that have been published in recent years, the science is only beginning to catch up with the overwhelming anecdotal evidence indicating that cannabis is as or more effective than conventional synthetic pharmaceutical drugs. Despite the emerging science and patient successes, there remains a significant barrier of acceptance within the medical community. That's left many patients to fend for themselves when it comes to discovering cannabis remedies that work for their own conditions. The traditional doctor-patient dynamic has reversed. Often the patients are having to educate their doctors about ways in which cannabis is helping them. There are a lot of reasons for this. Unfortunately, few physicians have become educated about the emerging science. Only a handful of medical schools even mention the word cannabis in required courses. Of those doctors who have taken the time to become aware, very few still have been willing to integrate medical marijuana into their practice. Aside from the obvious cultural stigma, the fact that cannabis is still a federally illegal Schedule I controlled substance has prevented physicians from considering cannabis as a treatment option for fear of losing their DEA license. And of those who see the value of medical marijuana, and even in states where medical cannabis is legally regulated, too many doctors are barred from advising or even discussing it with patients by the medical institutions that employ them. In the meanwhile, stressing the importance of deploying resources to educate healthcare providers and help them keep pace with the rising demand for information about cannabis treatment options, recent discoveries about the endocannabinoid system cannabis pharmacopoeia, emerging treatment protocols, spotlight that medical marijuana is not only a viable treatment, it could be a necessary component of human health. This science only enhances odds that more doctors will begin advocating for the liberty to integrate cannabis into their patients' treatment, and when that happens, it will also improve odds that the DEA policy will reflect consensus from the medical community and catch up with overwhelming patient demand. But until that happens, patients who are unable to discuss cannabis with their primary care physicians must continue to rely upon literature coming from advocacy groups published in medical studies and dispensary personnel to navigate their treatment options. Patients will need to continue to provide testimony to their doctors and encourage them to become educated. The synergistic doctor-patient paradigm will eventually shift back to a more conventional relationship. That's the topic of today's show and something our guest knows a lot about. But first, Dr. Brian Donner has our Medical Marijuana Minute. What do you have for us today, Dr. Donner? Thank you, Snowden. Since medical marijuana is new to my home state of Pennsylvania, I frequently speak with patients who have little or no experience using cannabis. I have found that their lack of knowledge about what to take and how to take it can be a significant barrier. Another barrier is the fear of the psychoactive effect, so I look forward to hearing from your guest today. You are right to say that we really have only scratched the surface when it comes to learning the many ways cannabis can help patients. Physicians and researchers are only just beginning to understand how and why it works so well to address root causes of certain conditions, as opposed to treating the symptoms alone. We are also learning that cannabis affects everyone differently. How and why has been a medical mystery that scientists are just now beginning to understand. It's no wonder that patients feel as though they're navigating in the dark at times. Dosing can be especially challenging for new patients since the way in which cannabis is metabolized is unique to each individual. Since federal law restricts cannabis research on a large scale, there is also a serious lack of scientific data that could help provide precise guidelines. 
By contrast, doctors can rely upon an abundance of pharmacological data combined with the patient's clinical profile and diagnoses in order to arrive at the proper dosing for a prescription medication. Beyond the well-known CBD and THC, there are hundreds of cannabinoids found in the cannabis plant. Each has its own utility and effect pertaining to the way it is received by the endocannabinoid system. There are also hundreds of new breeds of the cannabis plant with a range of cannabinoids, flavonoids, and terpenes that can determine its effectiveness for certain conditions. And effects vary from person to person depending upon the patient's health profile and a number of other factors including delivery method and dosing. It is important to remember cannabis has no lethal threshold unlike many synthetic prescription drugs which can be fatal if taken in the wrong dose or combination. Due to the way the human body naturally metabolizes cannabinoids, medical marijuana in its purest form has limited, non-lethal side effects when used appropriately and responsibly. There is no doubt that more clinical trials are needed to help doctors and patients navigate the science of cannabis and its benefits to human health. However, research, data, and education are all currently available to providers and patients alike. This means that medical cannabis can be safely and effectively used given the appropriate guidance, understanding, and ongoing education. I'm Dr. Brian Donner for the Cannabis Reporter. I'll be back again next week with another edition of the Medical Marijuana Minute. Back to you, Snowden. Thank you so much, Dr. Donner. We'll talk to you next week. And if you're, you're interested in learning more about Dr. Donner, please visit us online at thecannabisreporter.com, and there will be plenty of information there. So let's get started. I am excited to introduce our guest. Her name is Dr. Regina Nelson. She's the CEO and board president of the ECS Therapy Center, which is a 501c3 nonprofit she founded to build awareness of the endocannabinoid system and support peer-to-peer education programs. Accredited curriculum for medical cannabis industry and research projects related to the experiences of medical cannabis patients are also part of that nonprofit. Dr. Nelson is also an accomplished author, speaker, and researcher who earned her PhD in ethical and creative leadership with concentration on the issue of medical cannabis. Inspired by personal experiences as a medical marijuana patient refugee, her dissertation focused on the ever-evolving challenges faced by doctors and patients navigating the cannabis recommendation process stemming from the barriers to acceptance within the medical community. In 2012, she published her first peer-reviewed article called Framing Integral Leadership Within the Medical Cannabis Community and has presented works in 16 peer-reviewed forums, including events hosted by the International Leadership Association, International Cannabinoid Research Society, and the Integral European Conference. Her published titles include Theorist at Large, One Woman's Ambiguous Journey into Medical Cannabis, The ECS Therapy Companion Guide, and Time for the Talk, Talking to Your Doctor or Patient about Medical Cannabis. Most recently, the Survivor's Guide to Medical Cannabis is hot off the presses and ready to be released in 2018. Also pending release is the published version of her dissertation titled The Medical Cannabis Recommendation, an Integral Exploration of Doctor-Patient Experiences, which is the subject of our interview, and I'm really eager to delve into that with you. Welcome, Dr. Nelson. Thank you, Snowden. Thank you for having me today. Oh, it's my pleasure. I've been really excited to talk to you because I'm a voracious reader, as they say, (laughs) and a quick study, too, and I combed through most of your dissertation. Um, Obviously, time was a bit of a factor, so I didn't get through all of it. But I have to say, for an academic presentation, it was actually very easy to read, and it was compelling, because I've had similar experiences dealing with doctors related to family members who have needed cannabis, And I am really interested to hear you explain in your own words what that journey entailed, particularly when you became, as I said in the opening, a refugee, if you will, um, a cannabis refugee, which is becoming a more and more common term. Tell me a little bit about that. 
Well, yeah, and you know, that kind of happened along this PhD journey. When I I began this program at Union Institute and University, it's an ethics and social justice program, and I chose the subject of medical marijuana as my issue of social justice. I was curious, was there anything medical in this? I wasn't feeling well at the time, but I'd been a casual user most of my life, and I didn't really know anything bad about it, but I didn't really know that it was this broadly good either. Um, so after my first semester, um, I moved to, from Texas to New Mexico with the prime intent of becoming a patient and ended up before I could even accomplish that, having a major bowel resection surgery. The reason I had become so sick is my intestine had gotten caught up in some scar tissue and I nearly died. I ended up losing six feet of my small intestine and, I've had malabsorption issues and a lot of nausea and vomiting issues really since then, which exacerbate the fact that I have fibromyalgia. So when I kind of landed at a doctor's office the first time in New Mexico, I was really hoping for advice on how should I use this you know, plant beyond smoking it. This is really all that I had experience at. And I was really disappointed to find that the physician's assistant who was able to provide the recommendation that cost me $175 wasn't able to provide really any information. And so I needed to wait for my card and go to a dispensary. And as you mentioned, people go to dispensaries and they they really not equipped there to educate people on how to use this either. So I'm a voracious reader like you are. So I looked for a book, like how do I do this and what do I do? And many years later, I published the ECS Therapy Companion Guide. And as you mentioned, it's coming out under a new title in 2018 called The Survivor's Guide to Medical Cannabis. But it really is that guide of all those things that I absorbed of there's we all have an endocannabinoid system which is i think the phrase that we should all be leading this medical cannabis movement with because whether you use cannabis or not you have a stake in learning more about that so you know kind of through my journey of journeys you know it had taken five years for me to really understand that the leaders within this movement were the patients and that they were really sharing information mostly in a one-to-one basis or very small groups and that nobody was really sharing information as a network across the, you know, across the country unless they were doing that through social media and just helping each other. So, you know, again, it's kind of been this building through this journey of building to the, you know, to the fact that I, you know, looking at my dissertation, I knew my own experiences with doctors had been very very diverse. You know, I was very fortunate right after that near-death experience, though I was in Indian Health Services and then I was a Medicaid patient, um, that I had an Air Force lieutenant doctor who, though she couldn't recommend for me, was very conscientious about documenting everything I was going through. And those records have helped me establish that cannabis has been vital to my health and receive recommendations on down in the future in California and then here in Colorado. But two years ago, running this nonprofit, I ended up in Illinois, which was a new market at the time. They've now had cannabis there, I guess, for oh, almost two years now. But when I landed in that market, you know, I didn't, though I qualified under several conditions, I really didn't have the history to find a doctor who would and could recommend for me. And they had placed a really interesting restriction in place that many other states hadn't yet. And it was that you must have a bona fide doctor-patient relationship. Well, what did that mean? Well, right. to the state of Illinois, it meant they didn't want evaluation centers cropping up. And so they've been finding people who have doctors, very good doctors, who've been trying to service patients. And basically, they've set up their program to fail. And in looking at that and looking at how much this evaluation center model has really grown across the United States because – Again, we do have all this, we have this federal divide and most healthcare providers receive some kind of federal funding and Medicare and Medicaid are definitely federally funded programs, veterans programs, There's, you know, and they're all tied into insurances, which have some federal components. So with all of those things said, there's this big divide between doctors and patients. So though I was a patient myself and frustrated, I knew from talking with my own doctors who were in those institutions and from talking with the doctors that I was required to go to to get a recommendation who were in an evaluation center of some type or private practice, 
I knew that they were frustrated by these things too. So when it came down to doing my dissertation, I felt like it was really important to show both sides because I think both doctors and patients are marginalized within the system um, because of the same regulations, just in very different ways. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. And I, I think that this is a challenge that a lot of patients, particularly in the states that have just recently uh, regulated cannabis for medical use, a lot of people are going through this. And, you know, in places where they don't regulate at all, I know a number of parents of, of children who are suffering with epilepsy and uh, most states are allowing uh, CBD for epilepsy, and CBD is actually legal. Most people aren't really aware of that. But, you know, a lot of people do have some access in states that don't regulate. But in, if they need whole plant therapy, you know, they're at risk of losing their children um, right. to child protective services or having the, the DEA knock on their door and say, you know, I understand you've been inquiring about this. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty scary. And one of the, I, I read, um, I forget which chapter it was in in your book, um, about, you know, a doctor's office having, actually a couple of them, uh, doctors complaining about the DEA showing up at their door even after medical marijuana was legalized in their state. I mean... It still goes on here in Colorado, goes on in Oregon, you're in Arizona, it goes on in Arizona. I mean, I talked to doctors in all of these states and you know most of them had very common experiences when you move to an evaluation center they come and investigate you and they make sure that you're not prescribing they want to make sure that you know you're not to be prescribing opiates and narcotics even if you have other positions for instance if you are working at um, an urgent care center and you're working at an evaluation center, they're going to start coming kind of up your case at that urgent care center. We've seen this happen all over the United States, and it still happens. But the DEA doesn't have any right to tell a doctor what prescriptions they can and can't prescribe. As long as they're prescribing opiates and narcotics appropriately in that urgent care center, it has nothing to do with what they're doing in the cannabis evaluation center. And typically with a medical cannabis recommendation, these have become more certification processes because of these great obstacles. And even states like Illinois have changed the wording where a doctor is certifying that a patient meets the requirements of the program and may benefit from medical cannabis but um, versus providing a recommendation that they utilize it. And so, you know, there's there's still a lot of disconnect there, but People aren't understanding that this is still going on currently, as currently as I did that interview in Arizona last summer, and the doctor that I interviewed in Arizona had been re visited by the DEA as recently as April or May. Right. And, you know, it almost seems as though the temperature from the DEA is... is not relaxing as it was, like, say, a year ago. You kind of had this feeling that it was a more relaxed policy. Are you sensing that as well, that it's it's sort of picking up again? Well, it's picking up again, and it's kind of interesting because you mentioned, well, CBD is legal everywhere. Well, it is and it isn't. The DEA says that CBD is a phytocannabinoid, therefore it is a Schedule One drug. Mm -hmm. The Farm Bill says we have a right to grow hemp and to, and to sell hemp products within the United States, and we can definitely import hemp from Canada, which is a far better option than China or some of the other options that are out there. But the point is, is that people really can't get to the products that they need, even in legal markets, often and yeah. or at a price point that they can afford. Yeah, that's and, the that's another big barrier, the the pricing, because I know that and a lot of people just aren't aware that the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. We talked about this last week on this show. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals actually supersedes the DEA regulation on CBD and you know, yes. as long as it comes from the stem of the plant and not the flower of the plant, and it has a threshold of no more than point point uh, three percent THC, it's legal to you know sell anywhere in the United States, and and people can buy it online. But but states will you know come up and say no, well that's not legal. So then 
Well, that's not typically how hemp's being grown for CBD either. Typically what we're seeing when it's coming into a medical market, particularly say for growth here in Colorado or Oregon where you have the right to grow cannabis and hemp and you can get a license to grow hemp, what we see often is that people bring medical cannabis plants into that grow, but they pull them before the THC ripens. So they get them, CBD comes to maturity prior to THC coming to maturity. And so they're pulling those plants at a certain point point and then they're processing them and then they might they mostly are able to obtain cbd at a very very low rate of thc even though that plant may have yielded close to a one-to-one at yeah. some point and so that is coming from the flower of the plant and it's not coming from the stem what we see coming from stems is typically coming and being imported from china and what we see there is they don't have good safe practices in growing <laughs> yeah <laughs> and i worry about that here as well because we're often growing hemp now and reclaimed agricultural land because it's an agricultural crop but you know if corn and soy and other things have been recently grown there what kind of pesticides and other things are in that and we've got to keep this in mind because hemp's a bioaccumulator right right which is which is one of the reasons why it's such a, a good uh, soil remediator as well and those oh, crops are not usable for medicine under any circumstances for at least you know three or yeah. four rotations well so, you say that but we're seeing it come onto market that way even by the largest names in this industry Oh. And, you know, so again, these are consumer advocacy issues that, you know, we we deal with with the ECS Therapy Center and cost per, we're, we're I'm working right now in Colorado, Illinois and a couple of other states because we kind of almost have to hit the state by state because it's an addition to rules and or regulations. But we're looking for cost per milligram disclosure in this industry, because when you go to the grocery store, any product that you buy there, you you get a cost per Per, per whatever ounce, gram, whatever it would be on the, you know, right in front of it on the shelf. And when you're now seeing these CBD products come into places like Vitamin Cottage, people can go in there and look at it and see that they're paying often in excess of a dollar per milligram. But when you go to a dispensary, no one is being required to provide that information. And most dispensaries are retail outlets, so it needs to come from there versus the wholesaling and producers if there's a separation of what is that cost per milligram. Because, you know, again, people can buy concentrates sometimes as little as two to four cents per milligram, but that same concentrate put into, you know, capsules, for instance, they're buying very small packages of four or six capsules, you know, for 100, 150 milligrams, their entire package. And sometimes they're paying in excess of 40 or $50 for that. So suddenly they're going from paying four or five cents a milligram to paying, you know, 50 or 60 cents a milligram. And if they understood that difference, they may make better choices. And again, that pushes to the need for education with this pro with these products, just like like with any other consumer products. Right. Yeah, it's, it makes for a really um, compelling push, I think, from patients and doctors to really, you know, uh, the advocacy groups are the most important. Um, Absolutely. This, this whole movement has been so patient-centric in general. So, Absolutely. Yeah. And the doctors in my study mentioned this and how important it was that patients were out and sharing their stories. And I, um, it was interesting because I chose to interview patients and doctors who'd been out somewhere, maybe even a show like yours, um, doing an interview of some type about their experience. And it had, but when I interviewed them, I asked them about their first experience getting or receive, you know, or giving. A medical cannabis recommendation and that just opens this huge Pandora's box of oh my god when that question came or when I thought I was gonna have to ask this question here are all these things that come into play so you know with the dissertation I looked at those things and that fall into that social category that are really ruled by the fact that we're still schedule one and we have this federal divide that breaks down institutional policies and those things and then I looked at the cultural things those beliefs that are in set sometimes in the hospital systems and clinic systems among colleagues, among the different careers that patients have, and, you know, how comfortable they are disclosing that, you know, as well as the relational between the doctor-patient and how people process it themselves. And I really pushed my committee to be able to look at transformative learning experiences as well. And they kept telling me I was taking on too much. But the 
purpose to it was what the findings show. Nearly everybody that goes through this, despite the obstacles they faced, has such an experience that they've had, we could call it a transformative learning experience that was vital enough that it pushes them into some type of leadership role. And that's why these advocacy groups you talk about are so strong, because these are people that have had to go through these hurdles, and yet they know the relief they found, and so they're out there really pushing for the rights of others. So uh, we the people want this. It's a push to our government officials to get the things that we need. With that, we need to take a quick break. Snowden Bishop, the Cannabis Reporter, will be right back after these. Are you getting enough CBD each day? Hemp Meds carries the most trusted CBD oil brands, like Real Scientific Hemp Oil and Dixie Botanicals, to make it easy to add cannabinoids like CBD to your diet. We hold all our hemp oil products to our rigorous triple lab tested standard to ensure that you and your family receive only the highest quality and most reliable CBD products. Hemp Meds is your trusted source for CBD. Visit hempmeds.com to get our premium CBD oil today. Use discount code CBD20 to get 20% off your first order. You're busy running around from work to kids to evening events. Healthcare shouldn't be adding to your daily running around. Simplify your healthcare with Helterra for only $15 per month per individual or $18 per month per family with up to nine kids. By the way, you can eliminate doctor office visits with 24 seven access to doctors via phone, video, or the mobile app. Not only do you get prescriptions filled over the phone, but save up to 85% on those prescriptions. This is a supplemental plan and not insurance. Healthcare made easy. Helterra.com. Listening to the Cannabis Reporter Radio Show with Snowden Bishop. To continue, we were just talking about the studies with Dr. Regina Nelson. Yeah, and I think that all of these models, the social, the cultural, the scientific evidence, all right. of those things are factors when it comes to, you know, getting the politicians on board to trying to change the law. They absolutely are, but then you have to you know, I've been, I've been to the International Cannabinoid Research Society Symposium for the last four years, and it's primarily NIDA funded, and I've really been pleased to get a travel award from them every year and get a chance to talk with their director and others. And the truth is, you know, it's less than a half a percent of their budget that even goes into cannabis um, funding. And yet they're looking at a lot of really interesting things, but that information isn't necessarily getting pushed out. And on the other side, we are seeing more universities. Right now, a lot of our Ivy League universities are very much doing some type of cannabis um, research. And we're doing that more, you know, through universities here in Colorado. We've seen it in Arizona, Washington, and, you know, where a lot of the state universities are taking these on as well. And a wide variety of ways, but it's still, it's such a small amount. And we have such a vast need for the you know information and my research really is focused around trying to gather things that seem to be fairly common knowledge in the cannabis world that is not known outside of that and you know i give you the example of my dissertation committee you know they're all professors at a liberal sciences universe arts and sciences university And they've all voted for medical cannabis in their states where they've lived, be that Washington, California, Florida, Massachusetts. They were behind it. But none of them knew until they read my dissertation what was going on within those programs. They just figured, you know, hey, they have it now. People have access. This is great. They didn't realize that doctors and patients were having a very difficult time, you know, navigating these programs. Yeah. And that's a challenge. And also, I, I spoke with several doctors who are also coming from the Ivy Leagues that you mentioned, like Harvard and mm-hmm. BU and places like that. But my question is, those, all of them are doing research through sciences, but how much of that is actually trickling into the medical schools, which I none. think is an interesting question. Almost virtually none. Right. And, um, you know... And it's interesting. I met um, a physician who is a dean of a medical school, and he's also head of a major department, an immunology department at a major hospital chain. And he came to me after he had recommended to 
um, cannabis in a new program to 10 patients he knew were going to die in the next six months from opiates and narcotics anyway. And he was hopeful maybe it would give them some relief and some extension of life. And when he saw them again after they'd started the program, all 10 had significantly reduced their opiate narcotic intake on their own. And when I explained to him that was because of the effects within the endocannabinoid system, something he'd never heard about, he was absolutely amazed. And, um, you know, and he started to tell me about some research he had done with fibromyalgia, which connects with my own disorder. But I said, well, don't you have a big void in your research if you haven't considered the endocannabinoid system as a part of that? And he had to sit back and he had to think about that. And I go, it's time that you're educating for this in the medical school. It's time to bring this to the doctors of the hospital. And he was successful getting me in to do grand rounds at a major hospital and providing my book to all the physicians there. So they had a base of understanding on what standard dosing even is. But he was unsuccessful getting me into the medical school. I find that just completely astonishing, especially when you see the the studies that are coming out of uh, yeah. Europe and Israel and and South America and and Australia, it, all pointing to this very dramatic discovery of the endocannabinoid system and how huge that is to uh, to our homeostasis <laughs> in general. I mean, everything about the human body it seems is is reliant upon that system just as as it is with the you know pulmonary system or the digestive system or and well, it, I said this too I said well you know if that, when what I really think is you know we've gotten to a point in time we've really got to look at history and when HIV and AIDS became you know a thing of knowledge there were problems with with patients getting to physicians, patient doctors refused to see them. And so we had to mandate that doctors become educated. And now there are doctors that refuse patients who are HIV positive. No dentist will refuse them because they understand the precautions they need to take. Well, this is something totally different. This is probably our primary endocrine system. And it's, you know, it's named after the cannabinoid, you know, it's a, called the cannabinoid system because that's how we found it. Right, right. But the point of this is, you know, we we need to mandate that doctors learn about the system. And I think until we begin mandating that, we make that a part of our public policies that doctors must have, you know, a certain number of CME credits um, on the endocannabinoid system. I don't think we're going to see that. And, you know, I am working with... Um, um, compassionate care centers and the World Medical Cannabis Expo this next year to provide CME credits for physicians and to provide credits for, um, you know, the pharmacy techs as well from that are required in the Northeast. Because, you know, it's really, it's vitally important because, again, whether you use cannabis or not, you have a vital stake in understanding more about this particular receptor system. Yeah, that was actually a really great conference last year. Um, the Compassionate Certification Centers puts on, um, this will be their second one in April, I believe, in 2018. But yeah, um, CME credits, that was one of the first times, I believe, that such credits were actually offered in this, in this kind of a setting. Um, and, you know, sanctioned by the AMA. So that'll be a really great opportunity, I think, for doctors to really try to educate themselves. And there are, there are a number of conferences like that that are starting to crop up in different parts of the country. But it's very encouraging to me. And, you know, as more and more medical professionals become aware of this and how important it is to human health, there's no way that, that the the federal government can continue to deny doctors the right to use this as an alternative treatment or as a primary treatment even. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. And I think if they try to take it away now, the people would revolt, <laughs> you know. Oh, I would think so. We know too much about how successful it is. And it's, you know, it's non-toxic. And the way I've come to look at it is, you know, it's an essential nutrient. It's a nutritional supplement and it's a food item that if we all had in our diets, I think we, as a society, we'd be a lot healthier. We've only had it out of our diets for about the last 80 years. 
And so we can turn this ship around and mm-hmm. we can make our globe more sustainable. We can make ourselves healthier as people. But we really, you know, we have to take a very hard look at um, the outcomes of pharmaceuticals. And I get very frustrated when people tell me, well, there's no, you know, human trials in this. There are some human trials in this, but my frustration comes from the fact that when a new drug comes to market, there are human trials on just that drug. You mix it with anything else, even Tylenol over the counter, and it changes and they don't know what it is. So when I see a when I see a patient come to me and they're on eight, nine, 13 different pharmaceuticals, no one has any human trials on what that does to a body. Right. Well, and, and, what and we've seen, seen is really adverse things that it does to a body. <laughs> I was just going to say that exact same thing, you know, and especially in the, in the uh, opiate realm. And, and that's just such a national issue. I found it really surprising that the president's council on opioid, opioid abuse or opiate abuse is uh, has completely omitted anyone representing a um, a cannabis friendly scientific knowledge base. It, yeah. You know, every single one of the people I looked into every single one of them, and they're all staunch opponents of any kind of cannabis use for medical or otherwise, which is really a shame because, as you said, a lot of people are are beginning to transition off of opiates when they do start on a cannabis protocol? We're not only seeing that come from people who are legally prescribed a large number of opiates and narcotics, but we're seeing now a lot of substance abuse groups coming into this. And, you know, Amanda Ryman has for years published works on cannabis as an exit drug and looked at things you know, like alcohol and cocaine and heroin and, um, you know, opiates and narcotics in general. And, um, now we're starting to see these groups, you know, come in and start to ask questions. And um, recently, um, a childhood friend of my son's went through a rehab program and was actually given cannabis oil as a way to exit from methamphetamines. And now is maintaining, you know, sobriety by using cannabis oil. And I think that's that's hugely positive. Yeah can only do good. Um, last week I interviewed uh, Dr. Raza, H.J. Raza, who's doing a big CTE study, and he, he was telling me that in a lot of different studies that have been done on animals, they have been trying to come up with a lethal dose of cannabis, and no scientist so far has been able to do it. You cannot overdose on cannabis. It, no, you can't. You can't overdose on it alone. You can have a very bad experience, but you cannot have a fatality right. on it alone. Yeah, it just it won't kill you. And um, you know, the the emergency room cases, people going into the emergency room after beginning a cannabis protocol, usually it's because they've got a euphoria that they don't know how to handle because they they uh, overconsumed edibles or or things without being instructed on how to take them. You know. Absolutely. Well, that's why my my book, The ECS Therapy Companion Guide, is really helpful. It helps people outline and build a therapy plan so they can do this really comfortably. But the main thing is, is I also outline that acetylcholine, which you can get in an emergency room, but you can buy a choline supplement and the brain health section of any vitamin cottage or GNC or any vitamin store, um, helps you mitigate some of that euphoria if you have overconsumed. And in the case of, you know, early edibles with me, I overconsumed a number of times and I was fortunate that I didn't have a really terrible experience. I've I've been really lucky that way. But when I hear some people tell me about really frightening, paranoid experiences they have, well, choline supplement will help bring that down and calm them. And you can take up to 3,000 milligrams of it. And the worst side effect is you may smell kind of fishy the next day, but it will kind of help you knock out that high. And this is something that, you know, I've been talking about for years and why we're not seeing this going on more in emergency rooms, I don't know. The other piece to emergency room visits is people go in and they say they're cannabis patient and they often get diagnosed with cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. Oh, you come in, you're throwing up, you have all these symptoms. We've had patients that we know later, they, their gallbladder came out within the week. <laughs> that was actually why they had originally been admitted and they were told they had cannabis hyperemesis syndrome and they ended up in another emergency room and had their gallbladder out. 
Um, we've had people with pancreatitis. We've had just a lot of flus and other things like that, too. I'm starting to work with some people and look at something around neem oil. And it's because um, this is used a lot of the times when you have bugs in your crops. And, and this is a pretty safe kind of thing to do. But there's one particular component of it that an overdose of it causes symptoms that are exactly like doctors are saying that is cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. Wow. So, wow. I, you know, this is one of these things that I'm curious about because people may, you know, even talking with some of the cannabis doctors, they've known a few, very, very few, but some patients they really believed may have that because every time they would try to reintroduce cannabis, they would become sick again. Now we're trying to get you know, a study together so we can do some testing of those people's cannabis after they're diagnosed and see if there's any residual left from the neem oil, because that might explain that. Right. <laughs> and, you know, it's a hypothesis at this point, but we're leading in observational evidence compared to scientific evidence. And so the more that we can do and collect anecdotal evidence, you know, the more powerful that it is. And, you know, and I, I give you the example of, you know, you talked about this doctor who's, who's leading this big CTE study now. Well, we're getting there because football players have started sharing their stories about how cannabis is helping them with, you know, these concussion syndromes. And it's because of their voices that we're starting to, you know, get some studies because Dr. Sue Sicily pushed so hard at the veterans studies, right. you know, we're getting and seeing some things there, but it comes from having, you know, some, somebody with voice pushing at that somewhere. Otherwise we don't get anywhere because yeah. we're not, you know, we are not funded. I run a nonprofit. I'm putting out research. I'm not federally funded. I'm not state funded and I'm not funded by this industry. Yeah, and, and Dr. Sisley. by patients here and there, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Dr. Sisley had challenges with that as well. I mean, just from, she's had to move her study, and, but she's been incredible in terms of really raising awareness out there. I see, I've seen her speak a few times. She's been on this show twice, but really great um, efforts. And the veterans that are speaking out right now are also another group that are just really raising awareness because so many of them are barred from getting treatment at the VA if they're medical cannabis patients. And that's just criminal in my eye. It is criminal. We already have, you know, the, the feds have already stated that, that they can't exclude a veteran from, from treatment just because of that. Our real issues come around these pain clinics, and it's because of testing. They're doing drug testing to make sure patients are taking their opiates and narcotics, but they're also testing for other things. And when they test positive for THC, they're often dropped. And I've heard too many patients tell very difficult cold turkey weans from opiates and narcotics. Um, that were nearly deadly and um, so many things we've really got to get this breakdown um, you know taken care of one of the doctors in my study is a part of a large pain clinic um, in Illinois um, that really pushed and pushed because of the stuff that they had an office in Arizona and that office in Arizona had you know really at least come up with a lot of anecdotal data from their own patients. And the truth is, it, it boils down to, well, if half of your patients start testing positive for marijuana, are you going to fire half of your patients? No, you're probably not. So you have to adapt into a new policy. And adaption is a big part of this. You know, we've been in prohibition for 80 years. It's time for us to adapt back to a normalization. Yeah, well, and that's what we're doing here, you know, and, and that's what studies like, like the one that you conducted with the 20 patients and 12 doctors, that's, that's what's going to help. It's the educating on that, uh, it's normalizing the conversation, like you said, and, you know, helping people to understand that the things that have caused so much fear around this issue are completely not based in reality. So... You know, kudos to you for what you're doing and with your center and everything else. I mean, it's it's pretty phenomenal. So before we have to wrap it up in about oh, five minutes or so, um, tell me a little bit more about the dynamic. Did the patients 
and the doctors that were in your study, were they communicating with one another or were they just giving you their uh, anecdotal experiences um, individually? No, I spoke with them each individually about their own experiences. And um, I think in the end, I collected about 300 pages of transcripted data. (laughs) And I went through it and I looked at themes. Again, I used integral theory to kind of um, cluster that data. Because when you ask somebody about an experience, it's, it's all these different parts make the whole. The social, the cultural, the relational, and your own internal they all are a bigger part of the whole. And, um, you know, being able to look at it that way, I think, um, you know, I, I knew that there was difficulty on both ends, but the stories that came out to me were hugely moving. Um, I, I, again, knew a lot of these people had spoken publicly. Many of them were people that I've known um, in the sense it might have been like if I had known you a year ago calling you and being like, hey, do you want to participate in this? I know you're public <laughs> in this. And then talking to you privately about your experiences. And so I talked to people with that. But, you know, when it got down to their own private experiences and how it affected them, I, I really didn't know. And it was astounding to me to hear about people's um, experiences with Border Patrol with being fired from a doctor's practice, with being harassed living in a small town, um, child protective services coming in, their employers harassing them, um, their spouse's employers harassing their family, all sorts of issues that came into play around this. You know, there's just so many things that go on that we need to address. And the thing is... um, as a scholar that really, I think, hit me from the very beginning with this was that cannabis is a issue that has systemic effect. It affects, it has effects how we change this within our legal system, within the prison complex, within our healthcare systems, within our economic systems. I mean, the, the list is really endless. And um, we all know we've had a lot of political uproar in the last couple of years. And the one thing about disruptive leadership is that it it typically comes when people are pushing and pushing for change. And it puts it gives you a lot of of, um, ability to come in and make change. And if we quit paying attention to all the drama on the nightly news and really start focusing in our communities on making change in the areas that we need to, um, you know, again, this is the one issue that I think has systemic value in helping us make changes in all the greater um, institutions that, you know, that our lives are supported by. Yeah, absolutely. And I've said time and again that I really believe that uh, cannabis is one of those things that should never have been politicized and it shouldn't be it shouldn't be a, a partisan issue at all. And in fact, it really has the greatest potential of all of the issues that are on the table facing us right now. Cannabis should be one of those things that actually could bring the country together in terms of, in terms of getting behind it. And I mean, the medical science, if nothing else, is one of the most exciting and monumental discoveries in in our lifetime certainly but i mean overall in the field of medicine you know this this whole discovery of what what can and can't happen with the endocannabinoid system and the and the body processes that that actually governs is so incredibly exciting and i think that once the people begin to really latch on to that it it is one of those issues that could bring two sides of the political equation together and um, start, you know, ushering forth a little bit more cooperation between law enforcement and the medical community and, and the patients who, who demand this, you know, because it is helping them on so many levels. I mean, it's, it is pretty astonishing. So, and the doctors, their biggest complaint obviously would have been the, the legality and the pushback from their own institutions. Was there anything else, um, and the stigma, of course, which goes without saying, but was there anything else that stood out to you when you were speaking with them? 
Well, I think, you know, they are, they are as frustrated as the patients are that this is, that patients have to go outside normal healthcare systems for this and that they're now seen as being outside normal healthcare systems when really, you know, a natural path, a chiropractor, an acupuncturist, these are things that are sometimes outside regular normal, say an insurance system. Um, you know, but there's still, you know, there's a difficulty with this because the chronically and terminally ill, um, they typically have difficulty paying for an outside mm -hmm. the healthcare system um, solution. So yeah. with that, I think, you know, poverty became the biggest area that is, you know, if I really looked at data that we really need to address. And it's, an, again, probably the biggest issue in our society. And um, that really has effect here because, again, it, it has a huge, enormous impact on the terminally and chronically ill. Because mm -hmm. if you weren't poor when, you, when that happened, you will become poor because of our health care system. Well, also, the law against cannabis has put so many families in jeopardy because yes. they've been incarcerated for yes. a harmless plant. Yes. And, you know, that diminishes their ability to get a job when they become free citizens again. It diminishes their ability to vote. It takes them out of the voting pool, pool yes. altogether, which is really unfortunate. And so I think we're going to start seeing some, once, once this does finally um, get the attention it deserves in Congress, and I think it's getting there, um, I think we will see that it'll have a major impact on society as a whole, you know, and our environment and our economy and the health of all of us living around today so uh, with that Dr. Nelson um, I'm getting the signal that it is time to wrap it up so uh, once again thank you so much for being here today I'm, I'm delighted about this and um, what an interesting interview so thank you well, thank you for having me again. It's been a great conversation. I appreciate it. And um, I look forward to seeing you in April at um, the World Medical Cannabis Conference and Expo. Yeah, Compassionate Certification Center's a big event. And um, yeah, it should be very exciting. And I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing you there as well. So with that, oh, it is time to bring another show to a close. I would like to personally thank my guest, Dr. Regina Nelson, for sharing her insights and knowledge with us today. If you'd like to learn more about research she's doing, please give us a visit at thecannabisreporter.com. Click broadcast to find today's episode. I'll post her bio along with information and a link to her website. We have a lot of people to thank. First, I'd like to say thank you to Dr. Brian Donner for our Medical Marijuana Minute update. And just a reminder to Pittsburgh listeners to visit CompassionateCertificationCenters.com if you'd like to learn more about the medical education for medical professionals or become certified as a medical marijuana patient in that state. I'd also like to express our gratitude for our radio sponsors, Hemp Meds and Healthcare. We could not be doing this without you. We have others to thank as well. Eric Goodall, the composer of our theme song, Evergreen, and our producers and engineers here at Star Worldwide Networks for making us shine every week. To our program director, Steve, at XRQK Radio Network. And last but not least, thanks to all of you for listening. Please join us next week. It'll be 8 o'clock p.m. for another episode of the Cannabis Reporter Radio Show. I'm your host, Snowden Bishop, and until we meet again... Be safe, stay informed, share what you've learned, and make it a great day. Evergreen is calling.